Hi everyone, it's uh, five o'clock and uh, you are welcome now for uh, the third webinar on war injuries from the Alive Solidarity Initiative. So it's a running webinar gathering military and civilian experience on uh, war injuries. And today uh, the topic will be blast and burn injury. I'm Hamada and I will moderate this session with uh, Luca Carenzo. Luca, wanna say a word or? Yes, hi, hello everyone. I'm uh, Luca, uh, Luca Carenzo from uh, Milano, Italy, and uh, I'm pleased to be moderating this uh, fourth webinar of the Solidarity series. We are going to dive in into meeting our uh, experts from uh, today's webinar. Uh, what today's webinar will be about uh, blast and burns. And uh, I'm gonna first uh, briefly introduce the first uh, speaker from today, which is uh, Professor Peter Mahoney, and I will let him introduce himself. Thank you, Luca. Good evening, everybody. My name is Peter Mahoney, and I'm an anesthesiologist from the UK. Uh, I've had experience of war injuries in Iraq, Afghanistan, and another, or, uh, and a number of other conflict theatres. Uh, what I'm going to do, I'm going to talk about, to give you an overview of blast injury, and some of the classifications, and then the other talks we believe will plug into those. So this will just be a brief introduction. Should I start sharing the screen now, Luca? Uh, maybe we will introduce all the experts okay. and, and give you back the talk for the introduction. That's so um, our second expert is uh, Jan Vess from Belgium. And I give you uh, the way to introduce yourself, Jan. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Jan Vaas, uh, adjutant major in the Belgian Army. I'm a nurse specialist in uh, crisis management and medical cyberne, and I have a background on critical care uh, nursing. I worked for uh, 15 years in a burn center in Brussels, and for 20 years I worked in the emergency medical system as an uh, ER nurse. I will talk uh, to you about uh, uh, an experience brief, um, the, my personal uh, experience after the bombings in Zaventem in 2016, when I was on scene uh, as a medical team. Thank you, thank you, Jan. And our third expert is uh, Professor Thomas Leclerc from Paris, and I will let him introduce. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm also an anesthesiologist intensivist, and I'm the head of the Burn Center, the National Burn Center of the French military in Clamart in the Paris suburbs. And I hope we'll be able to discuss those together. Thank you all. We have a little sound problem with Thomas at remaining, so we might be fixing that uh, in the few minutes. So maybe, Peter, um, you can introduce today's session with your uh, presentation, your short presentation. Thank you, Sophie. I'll try and share my screen now. Uh, for the audience, please uh, feel free to ask a question within the running chat, and we will be looking at uh, the chat to, to gather your question and to ask the question to the, to the experts. Thank you, Sophie. So, as I mentioned, I'm Professor Peter Mahoney. I'm an anesthesiologist in the UK. I have a clinical role and also an academic role. And my academic role is based at the Centre for Blast Injury Studies at Imperial College in London. What I wanted to do was give a brief overview of blast injuries and really say to all the people listening out there that within your normal clinical work, you have the skills and the knowledge to manage patients with these injuries. The key thing is about thinking about the injuries perhaps in a slightly different way and being able to place the knowledge that you already have and understand how that fits with blast injury. So this is a Department of Defense directive from the United States military, which classifies blast injuries into five different components. And we're going to have a separate lecture on burns, 
And when we have a lecture on Jan's experiences, I'm sure we'll see clinical illustrations of how a lot of these mechanisms actually appear in practice. I'm not going to read it out to you, you can all read, but the reference at the bottom is open access and you'll be able to download that for yourselves. I find pictures particularly helpful and as I'm sure we'll hear in, in Jan's presentation, blast injuries are frequently mixed. So although we have a neat classification of the different types of injuries, you can see from this picture that an individual could be hurt by a, a blast by the shockwave, injured by fragments, displaced and thrown to get a tertiary injury, and have additional injuries, quaternary injuries, such as burns. So frequently we see a mixed picture, but having an understanding of the different mechanisms allows us to address those when we're seeing our casualties. Now, with the current war in uh, the forefront of our minds, there's been a lot of discussion, certainly in the UK media, about the different types of weapons. And I think here it's just important to say that weapons can be optimised if you're a weapons designer, to create particular effects. There are blast weapons, which will produce a blast effect predominantly and give you blast type injuries, such as blast lung, or cause building collapse and give you the tertiary injuries. Or there are fragmentation weapons, the typical shells, grenades, things that we're probably more familiar with, which will throw fragments and give us our casualties penetrating injuries. This, I think, is a helpful illustration taken from a paper by Howard Champion, John, and John Holcomb, and Dr. Young. And you can see the reference at the bottom. Again, it's open access. And I recommend the whole article because it gives you a very good background in the different types of injuries and clinical experience. But what you can see here, this is a conventional type of munition. This is a 155 millimeter shell, which means it's, that's the diameter. 155 millimeters, and 11 kilograms refers to how much explosive is in it, and then the rest of the shell is made up of the fuse, the body, and fragments. And when one of these explodes, you get a cloud of fragments, and this illustrates that the fragment cloud goes further than the blast effects. So when we're dealing with conventional musicians, uh, munitions rather, we generally see a predominance in our survivors of fragment effects. But we can discuss that as we go along. There are other weapons which are optimized for blast and they're variously called thermobaric, vacuum, enhanced blast. And these are, these are designed and optimized to produce a heat effect and a blast effect. And you can see I've written on the slide there are two stages to the weapons functioning. And the result is that you get a prolonged shock wave and a fireball, and the prolonged shock wave gives more blast effects in the casualty, and is also responsible for bringing down buildings and creating crush injuries. And again, I'm sure we'll hear about that when Jan talks. There are two very helpful references here that give you more technical information on those weapon systems, should you wish it. Now, because in the UK we were faced with a number of terror-related injuries uh, from about 20, 2017 onwards, our National Health Service and our military produced these guidelines, which are freely available on the internet. And we have guidelines for ballistic injury, blade injury, and blast injury. And you can download these. And what they do, they give you an easy aid memoir, an easy reference. If you suddenly hear you've got blast casualties coming in, you can open the guidelines, you can look at the blast page, and it gives you a very re rapid reference to say, well, this is what I need to think about. And as I said at the beginning, this is just reaching into your normal clinical skill sets of things that you all know already, but just giving you a structure to hang it on when you're managing these type of injuries. And the first page shows you a casualty, and the second page gives you a little bit of background of the different types of weapons and also the differences in clinical effect of a bomb, say, in a location with a victim or outside a location or building with the victim inside the building, and a little bit on suicide bombers as well. 
Finally, I'd offer some additional references, which we can discuss, if, uh, if you wish, on our experience of lung injury, um, a series of papers which talk a bit about the science behind BLAST research, and the final one, which I would really strongly recommend by Robin Coupland, who at the time was with the ICRC, who talks very um, knowledgeably about the triage of casualties in resource limited environments and the type of thinking we may need to have if the number of casualties that we're faced with overwhelms our resources. So I'll stop sharing now. That's my introduction. I look forward to any questions and look forward to hearing the other speakers' presentations. Thank you. Thank you a lot, Peter. That was very clear. It's very interesting references. We would like to dip into each of them. And I invite uh, all the participants to don't know the NHS uh, guidelines and uh, uh, on war injury, which is very, very nicely uh, prepared and presented. And uh, it's a very um, informative. Um, do you have any already? Do you have any questions? In I think what, uh, for any questions, we should remember that this is a sort of a round table. So participants should not expect fully formal lectures from all the experts, but the experts are here and available to discuss. So we should share any doubts, any questions. Uh, Peter made a beautiful introduction on the topic, but like now it's uh, any expert can interact at any time. Um, as a civilian doctor, I have a question. Uh, when you arrive in, um, in a space where there was an explosion and with many casualties, you organize your thinking like um, massive hemorrhage A, B, C, D, or you think about first uh, type of lesion, second, third, and, uh, and you look in, in your organization of uh, trying to find the different injuries. Do you or also, um, besides the A, B, C, D, E, do you also do first type of injury, second type of injury to, to, to cover all the broad type of injuries that you can have with BLAST? I think I'm sure that we'll hear more from Shamyan when he talks about uh, his clinical experience as well, Sophie. Um, okay. If I relate to uh, receiving blast or going out, going out to blast casualties on the helicopters in Afghanistan, the first thing was a secure environment, being, making sure there was no secondary devices or immediate threat, or if there was an immediate threat, having that dealt with by our gunships and other resources. But safety, clearly safety for our team, and then thinking very much along the lines of CABC, that if we treat CABC, our catastrophic hemorrhage, our airway issues, our breathing, our additional circulation, and work our way down like that, the injuries will reveal themselves to you. So by doing that approach, you will catch and deal with the immediate life-threatening injuries. And again, as I'm sure we're going to hear from the, the other speakers, Blast injuries, like burn injuries, reveal themselves over time. And so when the situation and time allows, we go back round again, and we go back to those injuries again, and back to the person again, and again, take a C, A, B, C, D approach. Um, and so I'm not spe specifically looking for, I'm not specifically searching blast lung at that point. I'm looking for injuries to breathing, some of which might be blast lung, but also might be other injuries, such as a pneumothorax, a penetrating chest injury. But again, I'm sure we'll learn a lot of that from when you hear the clinical presentations. Thank you, Peter. So that's a good introduction to hear from Jan. What do you think? <laughs> I fully agree with the safety uh, situation, but that's an issue. Uh, when it's uh, a bus accident or, or a car accident, the safety issue, you go 500 meters away and the safety issue is okay in a terroristic event it's an ongoing thing and there um, we do not cope like uh, our colleagues from israel because they know 
they learn by experience a second attack we do in 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 belgium we didn't have that uh, that uh, that coping so safety is a big issue because there is uh, it's an uncertain situation you have uh, a second bomb uh, maybe a potential third bomb a potential uh, gunner or shooter so again uh, that's very difficult in an ongoing terroristic event and then we 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 go to the to the principles of uh, military medicine. It's like uh, BATLS guidelines, and of course, it's uh, it's uh, it's it's a bit uh, tactical casualty care. And it's uh, first you do the little C. It's catastrophic catastrophic uh, hemorrhage, and uh, uh, that, what I mean by that is that uh, our military, but now also our paramedics are trained uh, to put on a, a tourniquet to save uh, yeah to. To save uh, the, the to, to to get the, the, the control of, of the bleeding, but normally in my presentation I will uh, I will come to that. We might hear to your presentation and then discuss all together. That's good for me. Okay, please feel free. So uh, this is a picture of uh, Tuesday, uh, March 22nd in 2016, six uh, years ago. Uh, we are um, at the airport uh, of Zaventem in uh, Brussels. It's close to uh, Brussels city, where we had uh, three uh, 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 suicide bombers. And uh, at about eight o'clock, uh, they, uh, they, 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 the two bombs went off. Uh, the target was the, the, the airport of Zaventem, like I said, uh, a very crowded airport. And uh, in the second video, you will see uh, uh, the first detonation of the first uh, terrorist, and uh, that's uh, the guy with uh, number one. Uh, it's an overview where the event took place at the departure hall of the, of the airport. And uh, this is the video of that, uh, of that uh, terrible uh, Tuesday. At about eight o'clock, you see the explosion on the right, and uh, the people are running to the left. Eight or nine seconds later, there is a detonation of a, of a second bomb. So it was uh, it was really uh, uh, frightening for those people. And the third bomber, he had second thoughts, and he didn't detonate, and he ran away. So two explosions at uh, at the Bali of uh, of the of the airport, and um, it was a uh, homemade uh, explosive with uh, TATP, three aceton, uh, three peroxide, in a in a suit, in a in, in a bag, and uh, uh, in that bag there were uh, screws and, um, and and nails added to give uh, more. Uh, more uh, uh, damage to to the wounds. It's uh, it's uh, to to create uh, awful uh, war wounds. This is the devastating effect uh, of after the uh, the two bombings. And uh, just to give you an idea, the the, the bronze statue. It's like a concrete bronze. There were uh, particles found in the bronze this deep, just to give you an idea of the of the of the of the of the energy of the shock wave, the wave of that that the two explosions uh, provoked. It uh, was about uh, five fifteen kiloton uh, uh, TNT, the equivalent. It's 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 rather uh, uh, a lot. Um, that was about eight o'clock, and then at nine eleven, one hour and eleven minutes later, uh, there was a second hit, a second place where a second attack in Malbec in the subway, and it's in the, in the heart of Europe, and it's about thirteen kilometers from uh, from the Brussels airport. In miles, it's about seven or eight miles, so it's it was very near. And maybe you remember those images. It was in a subway, uh, in a subway uh, uh, train, and of course, the, the the you see the devastating effect of of, of the blast uh, of the blast wave. Uh, here are some pictures, and like I said before, I was on scene after. 10, 12 minutes with a second medical car because our military hospital is very nearby. And those uh, images you can find on, 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 on internet. And for me, I'm a, I'm a military. I went, uh, I had uh, about uh, 
six uh, missions in Afghanistan, uh, in Lebanon, uh, and in, uh, in, 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 in Africa. But there, I wasn't really in a war zone. I was in, an, in, in a role two, in a role one. I was in, an, in a controlled base. And that morning, I didn't, I didn't thought in my, my mind, didn't cross the, the thoughts that I would be in a war zone because the, 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 the airport of Zaventem, it was really a war zone. You see where the explosion took place, and we have uh, uh, in, 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 in predefined plans, we have a, a medical advanced medical post. Um, here are some more pictures, and because, and because there wasn't uh, really a fire, the firemen and all the all the people who were uh, at the airport, they brought the victims to that uh, advanced medical post, so they came very uh, very quickly, and there were uh, were a lot of uh, a lot of victims. We had in, in total about 300 victims. Uh, this is uh, an uh, an. Uh, a little slide to, to see what the uh, the uh, wounds are in, in in distance. You see on the on, on, on the distance going to the to the left, the explosion. When you're very near to the explosion, and I I I, I think uh, Professor Mahoney will 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 uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but. Uh, nearby the explosion, you have really of the, the, the blast wave, you have some empathies, you have burned patients, you have blasted, you have projected and riddled. Those are those five effects uh, the professor talked about. And then if you go further away, at the end, you have the riddled ones. But uh, my uh, my experience, our experience is that, uh, that the empathy and, 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 and that's really T1 patient. It's a, it's a prior one patient who needs to have care. But you see that for me, the, the danger patients are also the riddled ones because they are far away, but they are still standing. And that we knew that we didn't have time for them. So we send them to with a bus to our military hospital to buy us uh, uh, some time. The very good thing about that day was after the attacks in Paris in 2015, November 13. We, when it, we say all also when it rains in Paris, the drops will fall in Brussels. So what did we do? We put some military in the street, but there were also some military at the airport in Zaventem. And immediately when the two bombs went off, they went inside. And what is typically of the military guys, they have on them two tourniquets and they used immediately their tourniquets because our tourniquets were in our medical team, but it takes some, us some five, six, seven minutes to get on scene. So for me, the military guys, the paratroopers, they saved a lot of lives because they went in and they uh, secured the area. Okay, the third one was, was, was gone, but they saved, I think, a lot of lives. And this is what we did in the in the in the advanced medical post or in the in the medical treatment facility on scene. Of course, those massive bleeding control with tourniquets, the the little C, then the the A from airway, and a little bit of oxygen, of course. Uh, this the B and the C with fluids and hemodynamic stability. Of course, before the transport, a little bit of analgesia and sedation. And the thing is. Normally in Belgium, but also our surrounding countries, we always uh, perform a stay and play. Here we didn't do a stay and play because it wasn't safe at all. And the prior ones, the T ones, they had to go to a, a to an operating theater as soon as possible. So we, as a military, we know that principle of scoop and run or scoop and play, and we try to 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 do that uh, that day. Uh, that day in, in, in March, we uh, were a little bit lucky because it wasn't really raining and it wasn't really cold. But uh, I'm sure you all know the, the lethal triad. So the, 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 the thing we did, we, we tried to prevent the, 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 the people from, uh, from hypothermia. But it, was, it wasn't that, that, that cold that day. It was about uh, 13 or 14 uh, degrees. My lessons of our lessons uh, learned and our take-home messages is, is, is terror has no rules of the game. It's an, uh, it's an, it's an other dimension. Uh, in the first, you have chaos. It's very important to organize your medical chain, to look after safety situations. Preparing your, uh, your medical people for war wounds, because in a normal civil setting, we don't see that, uh, that 
type of, of war wounds. The patients, they need uh, damage control um, uh, resuscitation, but they also need, as soon as possible, the principles of the golden hour, they need uh, uh, a damage control surgery. Uh, and it's always nice to know, as a, as a regulator or a guy who has to spread the woundings, to know the capacity of the surrounding hospitals. Um, like I said, we used our military hospital as a buffer capacity to buy us some time for the walking wounded, for the riddled ones. And of course, every explosion, you have to think about, is it Seaburn or not? And that's why we opened our eyes a bit and we tried ourselves to, to prepare ourselves for uh, Seaburn uh, uh, threats. Uh, your own safety is there, of course, very important. And that is my, my main uh, lessons learned for, uh, my, um, for my guys, but also for my colleagues. It's always nice to have a, a generic plan and uh, with a lot of focus on, on training. And that training, you can do it by tabletop exercises. But uh, at that day, I was an on-scene commander, but I knew perfectly the capacity of the surrounding hospitals because I, 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 I joined a, a few of those exercises in advance. So I knew that an hospital X could uh, accept uh, uh, two T1s uh, for an hour. That's, that's, that's my main, uh, main topic. This is my presentation. Please, I uh, will stop sharing my screen. If you have some questions or some remarks, please shoot them. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. Um, again, we are uh, going to ask the audience if there is any questions. Um, gonna so see. far, we have no question, but um, Jan, how do you, so you told us that the, the um, victims that were a bit further away from the detonation zone were brought by a bus to the military hospital. So that's why the, the, the less uh, severe victims. But in this context, uh, which are the one you are going to, to scan to, to, to focus on blast injuries. Um, but if you have a riddle and a penetrating wounds, we know how to treat that. But when it's inside for blast injury for uh, the um, inside uh, abdominal organs or lungs, do you have to scan CT scan everyone? Or so how do you triage these patients? Um, I was unseen. I wasn't uh, at the hospital, but uh, the unseen triage, it's, uh, it's uh, okay, we, in theory, we call it a star triage, but in the practical, it was, uh, are they red or yellow or black? Black is deceased, of course, or T4. Uh, and then the, the, the red ones, those are the the injured ones, you see them, you have, they have, have penetrating wounds, they are unconscious, they have a lot of blood loss, uh, but you have also the walking people around you or seek for help. And uh, because the amount of the, of the, of the red ones was, was, was too big. So we didn't have enough uh, material, uh, medical material, med medical resources on, on scene. So we had to make a, a triage and we, uh, we very quickly saw that that we had to put the, the walking patients into a, a, a normal city bus and we, we, we send them to the hospital to buy us some time at the scene, but also to buy us some time at the patient because we know that uh, from the Paris attacks and from literature that the T3, there's a walking patients with penetrating wounds, yeah, he can deteriorate to a T1 or T, to a T2. So that was our idea on scene. Uh, I know at the military hospital, it was, uh, yeah, they performed some CT scans, but yeah, it's it's more, it's it's a combination of, of, of ethics uh, and scan, but also a clinical investigation, of course. Is that a, a, an answer to your question? Yeah, so it's rather physiology that is driving the patient to be classified in a severe, so T1, 2, and 3, then uh, the suspicion of inside injuries, uh, considering the blast and the distance from the explosion. Is that, yeah. is that OK? Yeah. It, 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 on scene, you don't have that. Uh, on scene, you have your clinical eye. That's, that's yeah. the only thing you have. 
yeah. So when we uh, think about the, um, the figure uh, that Peter showed us just before, considering the distance from the explosion, in real life, we don't have this, um, um, we don't ha really have these elements, do we? Yes, Thomas? Um, no, in real life we don't have these elements and uh, uh, we need to adjust only uh, to patients and it is especially true because w what has been shown in these uh, very uh, well-known figures by some Peter Mahoney um, is the ideal explosion uh, in laboratory in open space. Uh, actual war opens in cities and when explosions occur there are reverberations of um, uh, blast waves and often it's very difficult to classify people based on distance from explosion and you only triage people based on injuries and physiology okay thank you thomas do you have any comment peter so the illustrations I've offered you, the one from of the artillery shell is a, I think a very useful one when you to, to give people an understanding on a battlefield of the, uh, when, when you get, where you would get blast injury and where you get fragment injury. And the fact that with a conventional type munition, a uh, artillery shell, that the people who are close enough to the detonation to get blast injuries generally are either disrupted or very badly injured or, or killed from fragments. And the key thing about a conventional type weapon is that the its fragments fly a long distance. So that's the purpose of that one. Uh, the purpose of the, talking about the enhanced blast weapon and the thermobarics is that with those, they are designed to produce heat and blast. And so you will get a different casualty profile when those types of weapons are being used either enhanced blast effects or crushing effects if the structure is dropped. If we look at the UK experience of terrorist attacks and indeed our military experience of terrorist attacks, uh, very much as Thomas says, you get you can get a mixed picture inside a vehicle. And you get a mixed you get a different picture if a vehicle stays intact, so a train stays intact, you, you and, a, and a bomb is exploded. Uh, you, you can get a lot of blast-related blast injuries because the energy is contained. Um, if uh, if, if um, it's a bomb that's containing fragments as well, you'll get fragments and blast-related injury. If you get a building or a structure that collapses, you'll get crush injury. And if you're a confined space, again, as Thomas points out, you can get the blast waves um, effectively moving through the environment and being enhanced by the environment. So you can get you can get more blast effects than you would expect from a theoretical assessment. I think the key thing I would say is, is that yes, um, you will get different injury patterns according to an environment. We summarize that on our NHS guidelines and the article by John Holcomb um, also talks about the different injury patterns you get in different environments. And if you look at our UK experience, we've had very different injury types, depending on whether it was a pub, train, um, bus, whatever. But at the end of the day, the physiology is the same. It's still an injured person. And so rather than when you're going into an incident, certainly the incidents I attended in combat environments was later I'd had the luxury of thinking about exactly what had gone on. But for the person or people in front of me, it was taking the CABC approach, let the physiology reveal itself, that would dictate the treatments. And then down the line, the other injuries would reveal either as they progressed or through clinical, clinical imaging. Uh, does that answer it, Sophie? Yes. yes. Thank you. So we do have two questions from the audience. Uh, I'm gonna actually read the first one which I think it's a too young experience, but any of the faculty, please feel free to intervene. So the question is, if you have ultrasound, pre-hospital ultrasound available on scene, like a simple machine able to do fast focus assessment with sonography for trauma, 
um, would this technique be useful in selecting uh, worse condition patients? Or you would think that was not feasible or there was no time for it? What's your opinion on that? Perfect for uh, one or two patients in a clear environment for me. But in a uh, terroristic event uh, with those uh, mass casualty, with, with, a, with an enormous afflux of patients, it isn't... Uh, workable for example uh, when we when we play with a medical team two or three guys for one severely injured patient you can make an intubation you can make two perfusions we didn't have time to make uh, an intubation we didn't have time to make uh, uh, the, the, the 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 normal setting it it, it, it was too uh, the, we were not enough we had to make a, a triage the word says that if you make a triage you don't have enough uh, medical means uh, on scene to 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 help your patients like we used to do it uh, so ultrasounds for me it's we use it in in a normal setting uh, when there is no mass casualty within mass ca in a mass casualty event i don't think it's workable but i'm i'm i'm, I'm glad to hear uh, the, the the comments of 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 the of the of the experts Well, if I may, um, I fully agree with Jan. Uh, uh, ultrasound is truly not an appropriate means of triaging a large number of casualties. Um, uh, triage is mostly based on uh, uh, physiology and CABCD approach uh, when you have uh, many casualties to triage. Uh, uh, the EFAST or such ultrasound procedures uh, are probably not appropriate on scene. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, do you agree, Peter? For me, one of the most elegant descriptions of triage and the principles is in the Robin Cookland article about um, the epidemiological management of war injuries. And really echoing what both Jan and Thomas say is what you do has to be very situation dependent and environment dependent. And if you're faced with a large number of casualties and limited resources, you need to be guided by the principles of triage and doing the simple things well and doing the best for the most. And again, I would emphasize to the people listening, you can do the simple things well. You can really make a difference doing simple things well. As you move through the system and you get further back to a hospital, then the more advanced things like uh, ultrasound and scanning and imaging really come into their own. What I would say is that I have colleagues who are expert in ultrasound. I don't consider myself such. And individuals who I know who are expert in ultrasound did use ultrasound scanning on the back of the helicopters with, with casualties, doing casualty evacuation from incidents um, in, in Afghanistan. But then we're really only talking about relatively small numbers. So, and you're with the casualties, so they had the luxury of time and space. Um, so I think it really depends on situation, availability, skill sets, and what you're trying to achieve. Thank you very much, Peter. And uh, Sophie, do we have another question? We have another question for the experts. What do you think of the creation of publicly available boxes within tourniquets and bandages in crowded place? <laughs> um, very, very good, very important. And it's also very important to have the education that goes with it. In the, in the UK, we have the Citizen Aid Programme, which is a charity which has taken the, um, the best of what we learned in these unfortunate conflicts, doing similar summaries to the one I showed from the NHS guidance to give uh, the public a very straightforward first aid um, program to follow, very similar, I believe, to the Stop the Bleed program in America, and which is also being used in, in, in parts of Europe. And there is a move to push uh, Stop the Bleed and tourniquet-type kits out and perhaps co-locate with community defibrillators. So yeah, the further forward the first aid goes, the better, the more chance we have of people surviving. 
uh, it is a principle in 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 in, in some modeling of of disaster medicine had to put some uh, to forward uh, things because there is always at an airport or at a train station, you always will find some nurses or doctors, civilian, but they are there because they go on holiday and they can apply that uh, that, that that medical tools. But just to give you uh, an idea, in, in, in Belgium, uh, before the attacks in Zaventem, uh, tourniquet and, uh, and hemostatic uh, bandages, we didn't use them the only guys who were using them were the military and the civil colleagues they said oh we don't need that uh, we don't uh, are confronted with uh, war injuries and now just after the attacks the first thing we did uh, the ministry of health they obliged uh, every medical car and every uh, ambulance uh, to have uh, tourniquets on board and even the firefighters and uh, and the police uh, men are carrying those tourniquets those messages, don't say them in Israel or in other countries where they have a lot of bomb attacks because they know by experience to use those tourniquets. We in Belgium, we did it after we had an event, a serious event. That's a bit typically uh, in some uh, civil, uh, in some civilized countries where we didn't have a, and fortunately we didn't have a, uh, luckily we didn't have a, a lot of attacks. We, we The first big uh, terroristic attack was in, in 2016. France, France basically made the same experience uh, with the uh, terrorist attacks of November 2015. Uh, uh, we in the military were used to using tourniquets uh, um, forward uh, for uh, uh, forward damage control. And uh, uh, when the, the terrorist attacks of November uh, 2015 occurred, uh, civilian emergency providers uh, were not, not only used to using tourniquets. And we had to put in place a, a fast training program to, to teach uh, uh, our colleagues, our civilian colleagues, uh, uh, tactical combat casualty care and battlefield ATLS. And of course, uh, they were very quick in adopting these techniques and teaching them themselves to their colleagues and also to to the citizens because that's something very important told by, by Peter uh, you, you can put boxes with uh, tourniquets anywhere if we if you don't train citizens to use them uh, their use is very limited Yeah, I completely agree. But I think the message uh, has uh, gone uh, very well to the civilian doctors. And as a civilian doctor, I can tell you that more and more patients, even with blood trauma, arrive to the hospital with tourniquets, even if there is no indication sometimes, because they are shocked from other way. And it's kind of uh, slightly bleeding from the limbs, and they arrive with tourniquets. So the message has gone a bit too far because we are mixing sometimes like uh, very mass casualty um, events with uh, war injuries. And uh, I mean, it's mixing civilian trauma and military trauma. They are partly mixing with lots of uh, tips and lots of injuries, but some reactions sometimes are sliding from one to the other. And we took a lot of reflex from the military to treat the bleeding and to properly treat actively the bleeding from the beginning. So that's really good. And we can see that we have less and less very severely bleeding patients because they are more properly um, taken care of from the scene. Uh, but uh, for the tourniquets, <laughs> let me tell you that it's, it's gone a bit far. And sometimes we realize that the message uh, maybe is uh, not clear for, for uh, that it's for really um, tearing, limb tearing, or uh, uh, hemorrhagic shock from uh, from explosion, or uh, uh, even if someone is changing the tire of the of the car uh, in the in the in the road, sometimes we have like very severe trauma, and this needs tourniquet. But in civilian trauma, tourniquets are really rarely necessary. Expect from ballistic trauma, uh, for example, or a penetrating trauma, uh, especially, but in in blunt, it's it's quite rare. We have another question. Um, it's more a comment. 
Yes, but I, I have another question. Maybe you can go for the, the comment, Lucas, and I will ask another question. It's uh, quite different. Yeah, so we, we have one comment in the chat which uh, sort of wrap, wraps up. It's from one participant, which uh, suggests pretty much what we have discussed. Uh, so place uh, tourniquets with defibrillators and metro museums. So for every AED, put one tourniquet. And I think that's what we just discussed. Uh, uh, it's very, very important, but it needs to come with the, with the training. And I, I'd like to add one thing, just that doesn't require any answer, just something to think about, that we are, this part center now are very, very used in giving pre-arrival instructions for cardiac arrest. So even if you're not AED trained, uh, the DISPA center will train you. Uh, if we have uh, public access tourniquets, then there will also be you know, a pre-arrival instruction for tourniquets on how to properly, uh, let's say, position it. And so that's something that, that's important to think about. But that, that was just a comment from a participant plus my uh, tip. And then Sophie with another question. Yeah. Um what do you think of otoscopy to triage um, patient from blast injury? <laughs> yes, Thomas? Otoscopy definitely have nothing to do with triage for blast injuries. Uh, it is only part of the assessment of the whole set of injuries, uh, but you never die from uh, uh, tympanic rupture. And there is definitely no reliable correlation of tympanic rupture with other more serious life-threatening blast injuries. So otoscopy has no role. No, no single role in uh, blast triage. And this message should be made extremely clear. That's clear. Thank you. <laughs> that remains in our civilian idea of a triage or war uh, situation. But so we can clear that from our, uh, from our minds. So no autoscopy for triage. It was also a discussion in Belgium, and I'm glad uh, Professor Claire uh, uh, said that because uh, it can be it can be an additional value in an hospital, but uh, on the scene uh, you don't have uh, time to to look, uh, and even when you have time to look, it can give you a, a false uh, image because if the the, the tympanum is, is is still intact, it doesn't mean you can have a blast injury, you have to go uh, search it uh, wider and wider, like uh, the professor said. Thank you. Can I ask a question if we don't have any questions? Go for it, <laughs> Lucas. Yeah, so I have a question uh, for Peter about, um, so we discussed about primary blast injury, and I think it's interesting to maybe quickly mention going back to the basics of clinical approach. And especially we know that uh, blast injury affects mostly uh, airfield uh, organs, airfield cavities. And one of the most uh, commonly treated, uh, let's say, uh, organ by intensivists and in emergency is the lung. So maybe, um, can you tell us a bit more about blast lung? And I think the thing that it's interesting is that blast lung can present, uh, at least confirm if I'm wrong, can present up to, let's say, 24 to 48 hours from the actual blast. So how do we monitor these patients? Do we keep them in a specific monitor area? Or is there anything to triage those patients or anything about blast lung? Um. Our experience from, certainly from um, the Iraq and Afghanistan conflicts was, if it was going to present, it was presenting relatively early. And there, there are two things you have to think about. There's the initial injury. But now we're talking about blast lung as an entity, and there's really two parts to it. There's the effects of blast on the lung causing, causing the bleeding, causing macrostructural damage and microstructural damage. And that gives you one, effectively one problem. That gives you the problems with, with difficulty breathing and the hypoxia. And then you get a secondary effect, which is the inflammation secondary to both the, the blast uh, effect on a number of cell types, but also due to the blood within the lungs. So you can have a, an injury that can initially seem not so bad 
but then worsens with the inflammation. Um, or you could have an injury that is very severe to start with. Um, our experience was that if people were going to be sick, they were really sick within within the first six hours. And if they were going to be sick, they were sick early. As in, you, know, you, you, could, you might not see it immediately, but certainly within an hour or so, they were ill. And it really depends, going back to Jan's discussion about the type of instance that, you were that he, they were faced with, is, what, is how many casualties you've got and how many resources you've got. We had the luxury that we could, people involved in a vehicle explosion, certainly out in um, out where we were, we could look after them and monitor them for 24, 48 hours quite, quite reasonably. I think when you're faced with lots of people, you have a much more difficult situation and you may have to be guided by, by early effects and also be guided by the type of incident they've been involved with. If you have a lot of people who've been in a closed environment, then your suspicion for blast lung will be higher and you may want to consider monitoring them for longer. Whereas if you have people involved in an open air environment where fragment injuries will predominate and it's likely that people who would have got blast lung would have been very badly injured or killed by fragments and you've been looking at them, looking after them anyway, you have a lower suspicion for blast lung. Uh, does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, I'd recommend the, one of the references I've got is one by Tim Scott, which talks about our published experience of, of lung injury and our intensive care experience of lung injury. I think that uh, hopefully will be helpful in terms of you know, what, what we did, how we managed them and the sort of time courses. Um, for the experts, we have another question. And before we jump into the fire and uh, speak about the burns injuries, so it's from Guido, he's resident in anesthesiology. He's asking that, um, uh, so there are more and more terrorist attacks. He said that in this scenario, usually first responders are represented by law enforcement and firefighters. At the same time, a comprehensive CABCD approach can only be made by health provider when the scene is deemed sufficiently safe for them to join. So the question is, is it maybe the time to extend the training on bleeding control and basic airway support to police forces and firefighters? Do you think it will positively affect outcomes or will it just delay proper intervention and proper security from the scene? So, Thomas, please first. <laughs> oh, Thomas, Thomas, go for it. Uh, so, sorry, Peter. I think you, we are most likely to, to say very similar things. Um, it definitely makes sense that law enforcement people and firefighters uh, are trained to dealing with stopping bleeding and uh, uh, to tactical com tactical combat casualty care actually. And uh, such a program has been set in place for firefighters and policemen in France after the 2015 terrorist attacks because uh, uh, it, it, it definitely uh, it is definitely likely to improve survival with very limited delay uh, in uh, uh, the overall situation. Um, it is exactly what we are trained to doing in the military, where the, the, the soldiers are trained to tactical combat casualty care. The first care providers are the soldiers them, themselves. The soldier or his body uh, is performing tourniquet application, for instance. Uh, it definitely makes sense to train those people to do that. This being done uh, in all our three countries, uh, most probably also in Italy, Luca, and it is definitely worth doing that. Of course, we don't have uh, figures to, to uh, demonstrate the effect on uh, lowered mortality in such events, uh, fortunately enough, because we don't have so many. Uh, but of course, it makes sense, and it is being done. I, I agree with, with, with Thomas, and um, I think that's a very astute question from Guido. Thank you for that. Um, I would recommend looking at the Hartford Consensus, and that's open access uh, on, you can find that online, 
which is an American College of Surgeons consensus about um, combining tactical law enforcement, uh, tactical entry with ongoing immediate casualty management. And some of that was based on learning from the, the attack at the Boston Marathon. And I'd recommend looking at the published material on the, on the learning points from the marathon and the Hartford consensus, because it very elegantly puts together uh, some clear guidance and clear thoughts on when it's appropriate for law enforcement and others to be managing a threat and when it's appropriate for people to be managing casualties as they move through and trying to tie that together intelligently in um, a situation of threat management and clinical management appropriately. Clearly, it's very difficult if there's an active threat, we're relying on our soldiers and our police officers to manage that. Uh, but equally, we don't want to see people bleeding to death when they could have been saved. So I'd recommend those, those references as a way of just working those arguments through. Thank you. Maybe, maybe we can also add that uh, the, the, the counterpart of this approach is also to give a sound understanding of the uh, um, objectives and constraints of uh, police forces uh, 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 work to healthcare providers. Because um, when we are given clearance to enter uh, some scene, we can never be fully certain that no secondary threat will emerge. And it also makes sense to, to give uh, minimal knowledge, minimal culture, the threats and uh, how to proceed uh, in the situation of a threat um, um, to healthcare providers. Yeah. That's what I wanted to make clear in my presentation that before the attacks, we didn't have a good coping with that. We, 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 we perform a stay and play with our medical services. And after the attacks, and just after the attacks, we as a military, because it's a bit in our DNA, uh, like you said, uh, Professor Leclerc, uh, our soldiers, our, 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 our paratroopers are trained to, to perform some medical actions, for example, a tourniquet, but also an airway. So we teach them a bit. And that introduction was made uh, that in, in, in the fire department and in the police department. Uh, but like I said, um, our coping isn't really... Uh, terroristic based because uh, uh, we are very uh, soft targets and uh, in some countries they, they 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 learned not to be a soft target and there the guys of discipline too the medical services aren't coming to the, the scene the work has uh, has been done by full police um, uh, guys and fire department guys with with the medical training paramedics so it's uh, it's a bit um, it's 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 a very interesting discussion. Those uh, uh, soft target uh, issues. Thank you. Um, we have another question that we can answer very quickly before jumping into the fire. What hemostatic agents are commonly used on site in the field? Yeah, we used uh, Salox because we we know it. Uh, uh, it was uh, we had it in our stocks. But there are I'm not a, a, a specialist on 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 those uh, things. But I'm I'm sure uh, Professor Mahoney or Professor Claire can 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 uh, provide some us with some examples. Uh, same as Jan, we have predominantly used Salox. Uh, we previously used. Um, the, the quick clot um, series of, of agents, um, but you know, I've got experience of both of them, and I think key thing is having one you're confident with, you know the protocols and know how to use them. What about tranexamic acid? Do you give tranexamic acid to everyone? Like intramuscularly, or what's your protocols? Working towards it, we have um, certainly the UK military has been looking at more forward deployment of tranexamic acid for uh, for soldiers. When I was deployed, we we would give it on the back of the heli. Uh, it was part of our protocol to give give tranexamic acid, and we certainly give it in the hospital. 
but there's a recognition now of when we should be giving it, should be giving it earlier. And um, certainly there's work un being undertaken about the best protocols for pushing it further forward. Are you working towards having pre-filled syringes or even auto-injectors? Uh, the project is looking at pre-filled syringes slash auto-injectors. Cool. It is also part of our pre-hospital protocols. And um, uh, of course, the, the question is how will we be able to translate that uh, in uh, massive uh, engagements? Uh, because we have been facing mostly asymmetric wars over the last uh, two decades, and uh, it's probably a larger challenge if we have to treat large enough number of casualties. Okay, thank you. Maybe Thomas, you want to share a few slides to introduce uh, the management of burn uh, injuries, and then we will have a discussion all together. Can you see my screen now? Not yet. Oh, this is most unfortunate. Now we have a black screen. That's terrific. That's not the plan. <laughs> so it worked when we tried at the beginning. So let's try otherwise. Maybe we can finish speaking about tranexamic acid. Um, in the protocol you think to launch, is it intramuscularly or to make intravenously? Who are you? Uh, who are you the ones who are not uh, busy uh, trying to get <laughs> <play> the screen. <laughs> <laughs> Because Jan Roberts is uh, is really, um, I mean, he's really, really involved in promoting the use of tranexamic acid, especially more early, always earlier and earlier. And once he made a, a presentation to us and he self-injected uh, the tranexamic acid into his uh, leg muscle, so to show that it was uh, not risky and that it can be done really fast, really quick, really easy. <laughs> so that's why I'm asking the question. I, my own, I've only given it intravenously, given it to either by the intraosseous intra route or the intravenous route. Um, so I cannot claim any experience of giving it intramuscularly. Okay. So now we, you, we can see your screen, uh, Thomas. So that's a good point. So you might be it's launching awesome. your presentation. Okay, um, is, is it okay? No, it's no longer okay. Uh, yeah, now it's in presentation mode. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay. So, uh, of course, I have to do this short disclaimer. I'm speaking on my own uh, in that presentation. A few key messages regarding um, uh, burns at war. First, the, the first key message is that fire is indistinguishable from. Uh, uh, has been so uh, for millennium, for, for millenniums actually, uh, but it is of course uh, very actual now. Uh, these images are not so uh, actual as those we can find in all medias about war uh, in Ukraine right now, uh, but some of these are bad souvenirs for most of us. Um, and burns occur to war uh, in any places underground in the air or uh, taking off or landing, and also at sea, as illustrated in these uh, situations, typical situations. Combat-related burns are frequent. Uh, they are frequent, they, um, uh, they reach uh, five to 20% of war casualties, depending on the series you are reading. And a very important message uh, in line with what we've been discussing from the beginning of this webinar is that burns very rarely occur alone at war. 50% of uh, combat casualties having sustained burns also have an associated penetrating trauma. And this makes war burns very different with, uh, from burns in civilian settings. 
Warburns are only, uh, Warburn is only one injury among other ones with typical situations in combat, uh, which are that of uh, vehicle born casualty. Uh, I'm rather discussing armored vehicles there from the military experience. Uh, vehicle borne casualties, uh, most often sustained most severe boats, as illustrated on the top of this slide, uh, with this uh, soldier having sustained very severe burns associated with trauma. And please note that he also bears the, the, the imprint of the body armor, which provided supplementary protection. Um, as an opposed situation, you have the disembarked casualty, the, the casualty of sustained burns uh, on open ground, uh, with most often lower severity burns. Um, what, we must, uh, must, what we must keep in mind from that is that combined injuries, associating burns with shrapnel wounds, with blast injuries and potentially crash injuries, as very, well as very well described by Peter, is what we need to um, keep in mind when we are discussing burns at war. We need to expect associated injuries and to look for them to keep systematic because the burns can make caregivers blind. They are quite obvious, of course, uh, but although they are obvious, uh, they can mask uh, at least as important injury and more quickly life-threatening injuries as illustrated on this slide. Um, a few words on um, burns uh, in the, the first response to situations, burns in tactical combat casualty care or in battlefield advanced trauma life support. Um, we must keep in mind that best care under fire is fire superiority. And what we are discussing here is tactical fire, actually. Um, with that in mind, we can proceed to uh, medical treatment um, uh, with the fact that we need to keep systematic with uh, CABCD, CABCDE, uh, because it's the only way not to miss life threatening injuries, uh, who threaten lives in minutes. Uh, focusing on life-threatening injuries who uh, threaten lives in hours or days. Um, that's why in the primary survey of tactical combat casualty care or battlefield ATLS, there is definitely no burn specificity. You detect and you treat first what kills first, and the usual priorities are hemorrhage and asphyxia. And I won't discuss that here because it's the topic of many other um, uh, sessions of these uh, series of webinars. Only in secondary surveys in these approaches of tactical combat casualty care of battlefield ATLS do burns uh, need to be taken into account. A few um, useful tools to address the patient at war uh, are uh, simplifying tools. Uh, most of us probably have learned how to assess burn severity by total burn severity assessment, total burn surface area burn assessment, using more complex tools, but a very fine tool developed by our British colleagues, uh, civilian British colleagues, actually, to um, uh, quickly assess burns uh, on scene is the serial halving method. It basically it consists of dividing the uh, surface of the body in uh, successive halves, uh, front and back, uh, top and bottom, uh, with the belt uh, giving the uh, separation between both, uh, and then uh, left and right. And this uh, very quickly gives you an overview of uh, how um, extensive burns are. And this is an ideal tool for initial assessment of the single casualty, and even more for triage. Uh, other tools you've been uh, used to using uh, should be reserved to uh, further assessment in a better situation than forward. As for the initial management of one single burnt casualty, um, which should be the basics uh, of managing several casualties and potentially multiple or mass casualties, uh, definitely at war the priority must be kept to associated injuries and we'll never insist enough on the necessity to focus on CABCD. Um, as far as burns are concerned, the main questions are fluid infusion, uh, which should be titrated as soon as possible, uh, airway control, um, plus potential uh, ventilation, uh, and very important aspect is hypothermia prevention. Uh, with, of course, the key issue of analgesia and sedation, which I won't discuss unless there are uh, questions about that. And 
and another very important message is that burns uh, never uh, request antibiotics in the early days unless for associated trauma. Um, we need to have a look at history, uh, a, a very quick look at history. Uh, this, um, this is not a war uh, incident. This was uh, a dramatic uh, traffic accident in Spain uh, in the late 70s uh, in Los Alfaques. Um, in, in this accident, which injured um, uh, more than 100 patients, uh, the road was cut and uh, emergency medical services provided first care from Barcelona and from Valencia with very different organizations at that time. And the most different organization was that uh, people uh, being taken care of by um, Barcelona ambulance services uh, got pre-hospital fluids on scene, while people taken care of by uh, Valencia uh, pre-hospital fluids at that time got no, no pre-hospital fluids. They did not receive fluids until they reached hospital. And the very uh, simple message to uh, keep from this uh, event is that first, fluid recitation, early fluid recitation in burn patients, it saves lives. Um, from a slightly different point of view, it also shows that burn mortality is delayed because uh, although uh, people who got fluid uh, had a much higher initial survival than people who did not, uh, burn management is a long process and also involves many other uh, interventions. And in the end, at that time, it did not make a huge difference uh, in overall survival. So burn mortality is delayed, but it's truly reduced with simple uh, by, early, by simple early actions. And this, the most simple early action is fluid recitation. Who should get it? Not every casualties, and this is especially true in a war situation, in a very austere and or degraded situation where it is uh, practically not feasible to give fluid recitation to all casualties. But we must keep in mind that many burn casualties are not burned on very large total body surface areas, and many burn casualties can be kept on oral fluids. And this is some sort of fluids. Uh, we should not fast. Uh, burn casualties if we cannot uh, give them IV fluids uh, and if they meet the following uh, conditions. Burns of uh, limited total body surface area burns. Uh, we, are, we have even interesting data uh, to show uh, uh, considering not a very uh, recent literature but quite a consistent one, uh, we could even reach up to 40% TBSA uh, giving uh, oral fluids if patients are still conscious and able to drink, if they have no nausea, no vomiting, which would prevent this oral recitation, and if they have no other intubation uh, indication. But for many of these patients, uh, giving them oral recitation is a way to uh, avoid this early mortality shown in the previous slide. And in that case, we should target uh, using WHO oral rehydration solution, uh, which basically is the uh, oral rehydration salt um, uh, in water, uh, which is uh, easy to find on the internet, uh, except for small burns where, sim where simple water, clear water uh, is okay. For all of us, IV fluid recitation should be no. Um, the second question is which fluid should be used for fluid recitation in war burns? Uh, once more, the, the, the specificity of war burns is the uh, frequent association with bleeding. And in that case, we should uh, not uh, stick to classical uh, burn recitation. Damage control recitation, um, hemostatic recitation is definitely the first priority for these combined injuries. Usual burn shock recitation will only follow when bleeding is controlled. Um, and because coagulopathy is the rule in such situations of associated injuries, plasma really makes sense if it's available, which can be a real challenge uh, in a war situation with disorganized uh, medical logistics. 
And if we have performed an initial damage control recitation, uh, hemostatic recitation, and we secondarily switch uh, to uh, classical usual burnshot recitation, an important message too is not to try to use catch up fluids, uh, physiology guides recitation rather than only formula. If we are not in this situation of associated bleeding, then lactated ranger is the reference. And we prefer to be able to add albumin after age six to age eight after burns. And if we use normal saline, uh, these patients are uh, condition is worsened by the uh, resulting resulting in hyperkeramic stenosis. And of course, uh, uh, if we are in the military with appropriate um, uh, with with the appropriate equipment, uh, we can use hypotonic saline as an early alternative. Uh, Jan showed us uh, soldiers carrying uh, combat tourniquets with them. Uh, French soldiers also carry uh, a small bag of hypertonic saline to be able to begin uh, recitation, IV recitation unseen, and we will switch to other recitation as soon as possible. Um, which initial infusion rate? There are many different formula. The, um, uh, International consensus formula is to administer two to four milliliter per kilogram of body weight and person TBSA, uh, half of which in the first eight hours. This uh, consensus is definitely very complex to implement. And our military uh, colleagues from uh, the US have uh, developed the rule of tens, which basically states that multiplying uh, estimated total body surface so area burn in percent by 10 gives the initial ranger lacta lactated ranger's infusion rate in milliliters per hour, adding 100 milliliters per hour for every 10 kilograms, about 80 kilograms. Um, but in any case, whatever formula you use, titration uh, to hemodynamic response of the casualty is more important than the formula. Regarding airway, uh, usual recommendations uh, of uh, intubation uh, should apply to a single casualty, but in a war situation when you may face many casualties at the same time, sorry, um, the, the main goal is to achieve airway control before extraction, but uh, it, may be, it, it may make sense not to intubate early and to evacuate the patient uh, spontaneously breathing and able to drink, uh, which will actually lower the uh, initial requirements of fluids, provided that you give him or her uh, fluids anyway. Um, if you need to intubate patient, please take care to fix, to, to properly fix the intubation, uh, the, the uh, uh, tracheal tube uh, with a circular uh, tight um, tightening uh, stripe, uh, because uh, the edema, which can be extremely, um, uh, extremely uh, spectacular uh, in those patients, uh, there's a risk of drawing the balloon of the uh, endotracheal tube above the vocal cords, and this means extubation, and you won't be able to intubate such patients. And a final uh, key message is that if you are really, really uh, in a, a terrific situation with a third degree burn, uh, longitudinal incision of the scar of a third degree neck burn can save your, your day and save the casualty life uh, because it will make you able to find your cricothyroid artery landmarks and be able to, to provide an emergency airway. Um, um, after these very simple tools, I'd just like to discuss uh, briefly the triage category of burns. Um, as mentioned earlier, uh, the unseen triage is mostly uh, based on physiology, uh, but it also has to take care of the, to, to take into account the fact that very large burns um, are a threat to the life and also a threat to the ability uh, of um, uh, local facilities to treat the casualty. Uh, these, those are the triage categories for burns. And please note that in NATO, triage recommendations, uh, a threshold of 50% is considered as the threshold for expectant um, uh, classification. Of course, this will definitely depend, uh, as, uh, as mentioned by Peter, on your C4 
situation and the number of casualties and what facilities you have and the uh, uh, evac possibilities and uh, you might have to consider triaging uh, T4 patients as T1 uh, if you are in a better appropriate situation. I also would like to, to insist on four common traps with burns. Immediate shock is not explained by burns. Immediate shock means hemorrhage or possibly cyanide intoxication related to smoke inhalation injury. Burn shock is quickly progressive, but it's not immediate. Second trap is initial coma. Initial coma in burns at war is usually related to traumatic brain injury and possibly with uh, smoke-related poisonings. An immediate respiratory failure is most often related to a thorax uh, or neck trauma rather than uh, with massive smoke inhalation. And anemia at the beginning uh, of the evolution of a burn patient is usually the sign of an undetected bleeding. The burn shock is a plasmaragic shock and uh, the uh, burn patient without associated injury usually rather hemoconcentrates. And to conclude this short presentation, I would just like to insist on the fact that burns at war are a triple challenge. The first one is a diagnostic challenge. Uh, you need not to miss associated trauma, and the key to that is keeping systematic and sticking to CADCD. Um, the second one is the therapeutic challenge, and we need to treat first what kills first. Trauma and burns need to be managed together, but with a priority given to damage control. Uh, plasma also being a very meaningful way of addressing the risk of cardiopathy um, associated with these uh, complex associations of uh, uh, trauma and burns. And the third challenge is a logistical challenge, uh, which definitely requires to triage and to evac these patients uh, as early as possible, because it's worth it's worth doing that. They, they can survive several hours or several days before uh, reaching a specialized uh, surgical team. And uh, it's worth doing that. And with that, I'm able to answer your questions. Thank you, Thomas, for this presentation. Thank you very much. So, so far we have no question on the chat, um, but is it really that easy to evaluate and to assess the initial um, total body surface area that is burned to, to calculate for someone who is not used to burns and who do not practice every day? Uh, what is uh, the good trick to know how much fluid you have to give and to calculate uh, very easily um, the surface body area that is burned. You're perfectly right, Sophie. Uh, when you are not trained to do it, that it's not easy, and it, especially not easy when uh, those burns occur at war, uh, when uh, you, we all perfectly know that uh, injured people uh, are first dirty because of uh, all the dirt you face on the battlefield. Um, that is why we advocate simple tools you know, such as this uh, very uh, astute uh, British tool of serial halving, because um, it is, uh, it is not so important to have a very accurate estimation uh, of the uh, initial assessment uh, of the total body surface to rebound. If you have a rather a correct uh, order of magnitude, it is okay to triage this patient. Is this patient truly more than 50%? Is this patient clearly less than 20%? Uh, is this patient in between? And those are the, the key uh, questions you need to answer. And uh, using the serial halving method is probably a very good way to achieve this initial evaluation. It, it will need reassessment at the second and third steps of EVAC. Uh, and then multiplying this uh, approximate total body surface area by 10 uh, is a very good way of uh, gaining uh, an initial uh, fluid rate, uh, but in any case, uh, as soon as possible, uh, you'll need to adjust your fluid uh, recitation rate to actual hemodynamic response of the patient and the uh, diuresis response of the patient. Thank you. A, a very maybe simple question uh, for you, but uh, what's your uh, favorite access for giving IV fluids in these patients? 
the one that flows. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's the one that flows and basically uh, it's the one you are able to put in place uh, quickly uh, uh, and which provides you a reliable way of uh, uh, administering fluids. So basically it is still first uh, peripheral uh, IV, uh, if not um, intracellular cell, uh, intracellular uh, catheters. But we must keep in mind that uh, these uh, intracellular uh, catheters have a high risk of further displacement based uh, due to uh, edema and due to the uh, manipulation of the patient. So uh, they must be secured very uh, tightly and they must be changed as soon as feasible uh, based on the tactical and medical situation with a more reliable uh, IV line, either uh, central, femoral, uh, or peripheral, if initial recitation have uh, given you the possibility to find uh, peripheral IV, which was not feasible before beginning recitation. Thank you. This question comes from an experience of one single patient. I don't have a lot of experience on burns, but one single patient I had that had extensive burns on both upper and lower limbs. And uh, it was tricky to, to gain access. And that's why I was asking the question. It is true that intracellular uh, uh, catheters uh, can really be uh, life-saving, uh, but usually uh, you use them as a, a reliable way to begin your recitation and then to switch to more secure uh, IV as soon as possible. Um, do you have any comments, Peter or, or Jan? about the burns and your own experience. We still have two minutes before we wrap up. Yes, I'm going to claim CPD points from listening to Thomas's lecture. Thank you very much. I've been making lots of notes. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, for me, a personal experience um, with the unseen triage of, of burns. I worked for uh, many years in a burn center in Brussels. But uh, unseen, uh, because of the in-depth uh, process uh, of the burns, it takes a few hours and, uh, until a few days. And like the Professor Leclerc, uh, Thomas said, the, the patients are, uh, after a blast, they are covered by debris. They are all gray. So the burns are masked. And it's uh, very, very hard to, to make a, a, a good estimation of the TBSA. That's my personal experience. But I think... Uh, Everybody who experienced it uh, on scene will, will, will agree with me. Thank you uh, to all the experts. What I will ask you now is a very hard exercise, is you have one minute each to summarize the main, the main elements, the key messages of what you would like people to remember from this webinar. So maybe I will begin by Peter, then give uh, Jan the right to speak and finish by Thomas, but please try to make a, a really short um, take of messages. Thank you, Peter. Message one, as clinicians, you have the skills to manage these patients. Message two, keep it simple, follow CABC, you'll find the killing injuries and the physiology will reveal itself. Message three, do have a look at our NHS guidelines because I hope that a lot of the information you need is nicely packaged for you there. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Jan? A little surprise, but I like surprises. Uh, message one, uh, terror, other dimension. Rather stay and play, do and scoop and play, scoop and run. Uh, secondly, uh, focus on damage control resuscitation and focus on uh, war injuries who need damage control surgery. Thank you, Jan and Thomas. Thank you very much. Uh, I share all the previous messages. Uh, hard to add one. Um, uh, treat the wounded, not the weapon, uh, and stick to physiology rather than to injuries. Uh, beware of obvious injuries and keep systematic and uh, searching for associated injuries. And keep it simple, uh, and it's worth doing it, doing it uh, quickly and simply, it works.
Thank you, Thomas. Thank you. I will try to do the same, the same exercise as a civilian. And what I remember of uh, this one and a half hour together, first, security. Because as doctor, we always want to jump on the victim. So first is security and wait, and sometimes better <laughs> to save more lives. Second, the earlier, the better. So we try to organize that police and first responders are all properly um, um, educated. Try to think about uh, giving, putting tourniquets uh, next to defibrillators. That could be a good way to, to improve this kind of situation. Then from Jan, it's a more scoop, run, and treat at the same time, because what I understood from all of you is that every, if it's blast, if it's burn, if it's whatever, war is bleeding. So first, it's stop the bleeding. Even if it's burn, it's stop the bleeding. And then aim, it's a, a, B, C, D, and then you reassess, and you reassess, and you always do that. And you, even if you have burns, you have to find other associated injuries. If you have shock, you always have to find hemorrhage, and you have to always do the loop like this to reassess the patient and to always focus on this situation. And then when you are panicked with burns, you just remember to Thomas, it's quite easy, around 20%, around 50%, and you give fluid as early as possible and then go to someone that can help you with burns. Luca, do you want to say something? Thank you, Sophie. I think you did a beautiful job in uh, recapping all the civilians' perspective. Um, I think uh, I would like to thank all the experts and uh, Sophie for uh, moderating this webinar. And um, I would also uh, remind everybody that there will be a next webinar on May 4th, War for Injuries, Chemical, Biological, Nuclear and Humanitarian Medicine on May 4th, again from 5 to 6.30. Uh, Central European summer time. Um, Sophie? Yeah, thank you all. Thank you to the expert. Thank you, Lucas. It was a great time together. And uh, so see you next time. And goodbye to everyone. Thank you again. Thank for you very much. Have a good night.